everybody. Um, on behalf of the Dean, I would like to welcome you all to this, this Dean's Lecture. Um, and it does give me great pleasure to introduce um, Sue Pullen, HOD of Department of Primary Health Care and General Practice, um, who, as well as recently taking over as, as head of the department, um, went on a study tour to Canada to learn all about medical education in Canadian settings. And uh, Sue's main sort of research interest and area, or one of them, is um, the development of interprofessional learning and development of teamwork. And I certainly think this gave her an opportunity to blend <coughs> educational themes together with, with research ones. So, welcome to Sue. Um, Thank you, Tony. Um, now, can everyone hear all right at the back? Okay, well, that's fine. Okay, well, um, apologies to those people who've already seen part of this presentation, but it isn't exactly the same as the, as the one I did in the department, so hopefully you'll find something new uh, to, uh, to whet your appetite for education in that as well. So just to remind you that Canada really is a vast country. Um, it is enormous compared to New Zealand, um, and uh, the, uh, the parts that uh, um, we went to visit uh, were only over in the east, uh, and uh, a very small proportion of that particular map of Canada. Worth reminding you a little bit of the context, the population of Canada is about 33 million. Um, most of those people live within 100 kilometres of the US border. Um, it's a real land of immigrants. Uh, Canadians uh, come from any, every corner in the world, um, but the First Nations people uh, who were there before European influence um, occupied a large part of Canada uh, before the Europeans came and now are about 2% of the uh, total population of Canada, so a pretty small proportion. Um, there are 13 provinces and the past in eastern Canada um, is, is old compared to New Zealand. Uh, the history goes back four or five hundred years of European history and of course many thousands of years before that for First Nations people. Um, but in the present, Canada is a vibrant uh, and uh, modern country living as it does next to the US. Um, it's a, a high consumer society uh, and uh, certainly a, um, a Western, uh, Western influenced country in its way of thinking and its way of doing things. Uh, Ottawa is the capital, and remember it's the capital of Canada, but each of the provinces have their own capital as well. Um, the Canadian health system uh, is comparable to ours, although not exactly the same, uh, and it's really part of the national identity. Of course, I was talking to lots of people who do uh, health professional education um, of one sort or another, but um, often in talking about what is Canada, what does it mean to be a Canadian, people mentioned the health system and they mentioned the health system, particularly in relation, of course, to the US. They regard themselves as having a health system uh, and the US as not, and uh, you can debate that point. Um, but I think it is important to realise that uh, the federal government um, provides a lot of mandates for how health should be delivered in Canada, but then it's the responsibility of the provinces to actually deliver that health care and implement uh, what the federal uh, directives are. Um, and it's a provincial responsibility by and large uh, to manage health professional training. Uh, and that, that point is, a, is an important one when you come to look at um, medical education. Um, just for those of you who are not aware, um, the educational structure within medicine um, is, is somewhat different to ours. Uh, largely, uh, the medical degree is a second degree that people do after they've completed an undergraduate degree. Um, and then, unlike in New Zealand, they progress straight into vocational training or residence training um, as soon as they graduate from medical school. Um, Interesting to note that in, other, the, in many of the other health professions, particularly in nursing, physiotherapy or PT, occupational therapy, uh, the structure is essentially the same. A lot of people are doing a general undergraduate degree, then progressing to nursing training or to uh, physiotherapy training for three to four years. And then again, if they're going to more advanced training, they tend to go straight into that um, upon graduation from their health professional degree. Uh, so a somewhat different structure to ours. 
Um, and I think it's also worth noting that the medical degree, it might be only four years long, but it's, a, it's 12 months times four years. It's, there's no long academic summer holiday uh, like we have in the more junior years here. Um, and the third and fourth years of that program are largely uh, like our training intern year and in that there are a whole series of clinical rotations uh, which people rotate through uh, for the final two years of that program. Um, and while they're busy rotating through those clerkships, uh, that's the time when students are making their choices to go into uh, residence training programs. So, uh, for instance, for family medicine, which is equivalent to general practice here, and the one I was uh, saw the most of, um, in the last six months of being an undergraduate, people are deciding that they will uh, go and do family medicine or surgery or internal medicine or whatever it is they're going to do, um, and applying to get into one or other of the training programs to do that. So. Um, no rotating intern or house surgeon years such as we have, um, and I think that uh, that was a very interesting thing uh, to see uh, how that worked. The, um, there are still junior doctor rotations, but they are all part of integrated educational pathways um, where the educational pathway is looked after by a, um, a tertiary education provider rather than a clinical service provider as we have in the PGY1 and PGY2 years here. Um, so resident training programs start from graduation, uh, they're very intensive but by and large there are less years um, than in New Zealand. Uh, pretty wide range of competencies are, are nevertheless expected. And one really important point I think, and I think it's very germane to the future of medical education here, is that all the residents in the different training programs are paid the same regardless of which specialty uh, program they are in. So if you're a family medicine resident year one, you will get paid the same as orthopaedic resident year one. And then in year two, there's quite a step up and the year twos get an increase in pay in year three, etc. Uh, so that it's a very level playing field across the different specialties. And for those of you who are familiar with general practice in New Zealand, you'll be well aware that in the training here, um, that level playing field does not exist. Um, and that was a um, and talking to Canadians about this, um, they, um, they recognise very easily that if there was not a level playing field, um, it would be difficult for several specialties to uh, attract enough people to come into the training programmes. Um, another important difference, of course, is that the residence programmes are all run from the universities in Canada. Uh, so rather than being run by the colleges, uh, which they are in here in Australia and in the UK, the vocational training or the specialist training um, is run by university departments uh, so that there really is a wonderful opportunity for vertical integration of uh, both student learning but also um, of honing and uh, developing excellence in teaching right across all the levels um, amongst the staff uh, within the university as well. Um, and while residents are in training, for all the years of their training, they are enrolled as both as university students, so they get the advantages of the learning support, the IT support, the general support services of a university, as well as being paid for their service commitment uh, by the uh, various local health authorities. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a dual support system, uh, which uh, to me, when I looked at it, had, had many strengths. So with that context about um, the nature of medical training, um, it's, uh, I went really try to, to try and look at medical education through a lens of IPE and IPP, interprofessional education and interprofessional practice. And both these concepts are, have been widely researched and um, embraced in, in many of the provinces in, in Canada. And I think the reasons why at high level, federal, um, federal funding level, these um, concepts have been so well supported is because of the articulation of uh, the need for workforce development being closely tied with uh, interprofessional education as an important component uh, of health professional education. Um, there's um, increasing evidence now in Canada to show that if you uh, can get health professions working seamlessly together so that in practice they are working together instead of co in competition, uh, they are more likely to not only be attracted into the health professions but also to stay working um, because the job satisfaction uh, is, is much better. The other arm of the equation which I think is very impressive in Canada is that 
um, looking at patient safety and quality of care initiatives, interprofessional education, interprofessional practice underpin uh, patient safety and underpin uh, innovation and quality of care uh, where um, important communication goes on. Um, and it, it's very easy, I think, particularly for people outside the health professions to uh, think of effective interprofessional working and teamwork as being a no-brainer, as being something that of course you would do, wouldn't you? Uh, sounds easy, sounds sensible, it's often assumed to be the case, uh, but it doesn't always work. Um, and I think it's very interesting to see how that translates outside the health professions. I got told recently by, um, by someone from Ako Aotearoa, that is an education funding body, that why on earth would you want to research teamwork? We all know how to do that. It's all been done. Everyone does it. Well, not in the health professions. <laughs> and I think the Canadians have been very good at recognising uh, recognizing that. Um, some seminal work that's been done by um, Hall and Weaver in Ottawa uh, a few years ago now, I think articulated in Canada very well why it is that the health professions find it genuinely difficult to get on and develop into professional practice that's effective in a routine manner um, because of the way we have been trained traditionally in silos um, and in uni professional education. So, um, Paul and Weaver, um, each health professional learns their traditional role through the education process of their discipline, and this role becomes an integral part of their cognitive map, and you can go on and read the quote there. Um, so recognising that has been one of the drivers behind saying, well, okay, well, if that's, the, if that's one of the problems, how, how can we change it? And I think if you think it only applies to Canada, I'd draw your attention to these uh, few quotes from um, Ron Patterson's valedictory um, article in a recent New Zealand medical journal as he left the post of the uh, HDC. Um, how we teach may be as important as what we teach. Our behaviour as educators matters. Are our medical schools silo institutions or do they model teamwork with other schools? It's essential that any barriers to collaboration, e.g. between medical schools and general practice, are removed and strong links developed. We need to draw on the best of medical education, both in New Zealand and overseas, in areas such as communication, teamwork and patient safety. Um, now, I don't think everything Ron Patterson wrote in this article was I would entirely agree with, but certainly the sentiment was there, uh, reflected from um, his 10 years as HTC. Um, so just a reminder of what the formal definitions about interprofessional education are, because I think um, even in Canada, where these concepts are much more widely talked about than here, um, it was important to articulate what, it, what people really do mean by IPE. So there's, um, there's three definitions there, um, and enabling different professional groups to in actively engage in the learning that leads to collaborative approaches to problem solving, decision making and teamwork. Um, is one that, uh, that catches quite nicely uh, what people are trying to do with IPE. Um, the most widely used definition of IPE for about the last seven or eight years has been the one at the bottom of that slide, um, and this is widely quoted um, uh, in the IPE community. It occurs when members of two or more professions associated with health or social service are engaged in learning with, from and about each other. Um, some people think this is a rather simplistic definition, but uh, definitions that are short are often more used than ones that are long. Um, but these ideas are not particularly new. The World Health Organization in 1988 um, articulated very, very nicely how important interprofessional education and interprofessional practice might be. And I think it's important to note that I, IPE is not different disciplines passively listening to the same lecture um, or those other definitions that I've got up on the board there. Um, I think often when interprofessional education is, is talked about, when people first come across it, they assume that these kinds of activities will meet um, the IPE objectives. And the Canadians have been pretty clear in showing that these kind of things do little uh, to get health professionals um, educated and learning together better. So um, with that preamble, Health Canada in 2003-2004, so this is federal money, um, put um, about $20 million into the development of interprofessional education uh, among the health professions in Canada. Um, and this was federal money, it was politically driven, um, there were some real champions uh, right up at high level in government who uh, provided this, the impetus to get this money. Um, again, driven by workforce recruitment and retention need and driven by quality and safety issues. Um, 
the requirements for a tertiary institution to access this pot of money revolved around uh, needing to have a school, of, a school of medicine, a school of nursing, and at least two other health professions, either in the same institution or able to work closely together. Um, so, you know, seven years on, um, I thought it would be really exciting and good to go to Canada and see what they had managed to achieve with that money uh, in that time. So, um, having a look at what they've done at the University of Ottawa, in Toronto, um, at Queen's in Kingston, um, at McGill uh, in Montreal, um, and Memorial University in Newfoundland, um, I think uh, those, are, those are five universities that are all at the leading edge of the development of IPE in, um, in Canada. Um, but one of the things all of them have um, embraced, and it's certainly part of the uh, Canadian literature, that the notion of interprofessional practice is just as important as interprofessional education. Um, if you want to educate students in interprofessional education, uh, all the classroom teaching in the world uh, will always get trumped by the clinical placement experience of students out in practice. So if the practice experience does not model interprofessional working, um, then students are not going to learn or retain um, IPE principles. Um, so the Canadians looked for places where collaborative practice was, was more readily occurring perhaps than in other places and uh, it will be no surprise to most of you I'm sure that places, places like palliative care, primary care, rehabilitation and indeed very high level tertiary care, things like intensive care units, um, uh, cardiothoracic units, uh, neurosurgical units um, are places where it is more, of, more readily easy to see that there's real collaborative practice going on. And some of this is necessity. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, and in these places, the discipline just doesn't work, the outcomes just aren't achieved, unless you have high-level high level teamwork going on. So this recognition that um, these, these three concepts are inextricably uh, linked uh, was, is key to the, to the moving forward of um, IPE and IPP in, in Canada. And I think the work of um, IBO and Dasson in Toronto um, is a very nice piece of work that does demonstrate, I think, quite nicely to their health professionals that there is a spectrum of collaboration. You don't have to have fully collaborative, um, intensive practice for every single patient encounter. That is never going to be realistic. So um, developing a spectrum of collaboration which moves uh, from the left of the screen over to the right of the screen, I think has been a very helpful way of conceptualising the concept of collaboration in the Canadian setting. Um, and they're very clear that you want to choose how much and how little or um, for how long uh, you need to have highly collaborative practice uh, for a particular patient care situation. And so if we're talking about teamwork um, and talking about the need to, for people to work closely with each other in an interdependent way, then you're looking more at the right end of the spectrum uh, than, uh, than at the left end, end of the spectrum. So it was a great privilege and pleasure to actually go and visit Pippa Hall and Linda Weaver, the people whose quote I gave you earlier on, um, who work at a palliative care facility and a continuing care facility in Ottawa um, at the Elizabeth Bruyere Hospital. Um, this is a very impressive uh, facility and uh, it was um, very exciting to go and I uh, went on some ward rounds there, had a look at how this all works and the interprofessional practice going on at an entirely routine level um, was something which students were able to hook into. They go to a lot of trouble to make their teamwork incredibly explicit, spelling it out in words of one syllable and I think they, the reason they say they do that is because well functioning teams can often appear it, the work underneath is often invisible. So for, for a student or a novice, an inexperienced person, uh, you have to sort of spell it out in words of one syllable and um, have tasks and cases to work on where the students actually have to um, start de novo uh, from getting to developing case and patient care plans um, that incorporate these principles. In Toronto, the Office of Interprofessional Education is a far cry from those skyscrapers of the financial district in Toronto. Um, so down over the, um, over the Tim Hortons coffee shop, um, a, a small but impressive office and some very committed uh, workers who 
um, have now managed at the University of Toronto to have 13 health professional training programs, all with a mandatory interprofessional education component. Um, over the four or five years of any health professional course, there will be components in each year which require the collaboration and cooperation with a number of the other health disciplines. Um, there's a system of achieving credits for IPE activities um, and those, um, those graduates don't achieve their graduation without, um, without undertaking that, those mandatory components in their course. Um, the University of Toronto has also been at the leading edge of collaborative research in this area um, and uh, a very impressive programme uh, going forward. At Kingston, uh, at Queen's University, a um, bit of a different rollout with the same pot of money, um, lots of early buy-in politically. Interestingly there, it's the occupational therapists who are right at the leading edge of the interprofessional education. Um, the, uh, they have a number of voluntary, not mandatory programs. They've rolled out their IPE initiatives in a very different way. Uh, they've engaged a number of prominent uh, disabled sports people uh, to uh, champion the cause of interprofessional education and the need for health professionals to work seamlessly together when you're dealing with people with complex, chronic, ongoing needs. Um, and that uh, engagement with a, with a sort of celebrity circuit uh, has been a very interesting and completely different way to the University of Toronto in engaging in this area. Um, again, you know, their office is on the fringes of the university, it's not in one of the big main buildings, um, but a huge amount of work comes out of it. In Montreal, um, at McGill, I mean, again, a completely different approach um, and a, a different place. Uh, and as um, my first day at McGill, uh, I met about six people who said to me, well, of course, you've got to realise that we are a little English-speaking island in Montreal. Mo McGill is the only English-speaking university in Montreal, so um, I had to go there, really, because I can't speak French. Uh, and uh, the, um, you know, if you go to a French-speaking university, you are expected to engage in, in French. So very interesting going to McGill, uh, an intensely research-driven um, university. Um, and they use their money for IPE to first um, get involved in some, uh, in some quite large-scale research projects. Um, and uh, some particularly impressive programs looking at geriatrics uh, and looking at neurotrauma rehabilitation teams, uh, trying to find out what makes good teams work well, um, to put it in a nutshell. And then the development of quite an extensive electronic learning platform of cases which are all designed for students to work on in an electronic online way um, to achieve interprofessional objectives. Uh, so you don't always have to have students in face-to-face -face contact uh, to, to achieve these collaborative objectives. Um, the online community is, um, is a place that they are exploring a lot. Um, there were also um, really good examples of, um, of research and teaching going on uh, at, a clinical, at clinical places and great to meet up with some researchers who were based in family practices, who work full time in the family practice but have got uh, strong links to uh, a number of different disciplines outside of the health professions uh, which they will bring in to a clinical setting. Um, to get not only collaborative teaching and professional education going, but develop the research streams that, um, that inform this, this area of work. Um, at McGill, um, just down the road from this um, very impressive street stature uh, in the middle of Montreal, um, they had uh, a wonderful simulation centre, um, all completely underground. You go, down, you go down underground to a whole underground city in both Montreal and Toronto, where all the buildings are connected underground because of the snow in the winter. Um, and so down at that level, you go down to the supermarket, one storey down next to the subway, and then you turn the corner and you go into an enormous, completely underground facility where the McGill Simulation Centre is. So it's completely uh, windowless, I mean it's, it's, it's completely underground, but for a simulation centre um, it works brilliantly. Uh, and um, a very impressive um, collaboration there with high-tech mannequins, low-tech mannequins, a lot of uh, training facilities available for intensive care specialists, um, operating room teams, uh, a number of uh, emergency resuscitation type scenarios, uh, but also a very extensive simulated patient program, all run within the same facility, uh, which gave them the opportunity to combine um, mannequin type simulation learning experiences with simulated patient experiences. Um, and it was really fascinating to spend a day there uh, watching a situation where there was a 
um, there was a team of people, uh, paediatric intensivists, who were, who were learning to work together on uh, particular resuscitation scenarios for paediatric um, patients. Um, but as well as the mannequin with the with the baby uh, and the um, and the team who were working on that, um, there was a simulated patient mother who complicated the whole scenario by being distressed, um, upset, uh, and the team then had to turn around and deal with the rel the mother and the other relatives as well as undertaking the resuscitation. So really creating high quality <coughs> simulation, uh, which allowed um, for. Um, many of the different factors that come into play in real time uh, to be replicated um, in, a, in a very realistic way indeed and it was very impressive seeing how the uh, the team of students experienced clinicians actually um, had had trouble or didn't have trouble with various aspects of that kind of scenario um, so the opportunity for excellent interprofessional education experiences is in a simulation setting um, and of course this is not the only place in the world that is experimenting with these things but this was a particularly impressive simulation centre. Um, nine full-time staff to run it uh, and uh, you literally can ring up and book your session and they'll do the rest. Uh, very impressive support uh, for faculty. And at McGill as well, at the Lady Meredith House, is the Centre for Medical Education at McGill. This is one of the leading um, centres for medical education uh, in, uh, in all of Canada. Yvonne Steinert is the um, uh, Professor of Medical Education here. Uh, and uh, this is a tremendous facility which uh, supports um, a, a whole range of faculty development for the staff at McGill. Um, looks after clinical teachers, looks after faculty staff. Um, provides assistance with teaching and learning skills, but also the academic leadership skills come out of this facility um, the, and research skills for staff as well. So they provide a wide range of faculty development support. Um, they have um, one-off workshops, they have scholars programs, they have a flourishing research program going and just while I was there um, they um, had made no bones at all about the fact that they had they had managed to achieve significant endowment money um, to uh, get a second professor involved in medical education research uh, for, uh, for, the, for the facility. Um, so a wide range of programs running out of there. Um, again, um, six full-time um, staff who, whose sole job it is is to mount and run these programs. So again, as faculty, fantastic facility, you can basically ring up and say, I would like to do this, um, and they will, they will organise your resources and do, do the lot in terms of organising um, how, how the facility will run. Still, on to St John's. Um, St John's is um, the, really the only significant urban centre in, uh, in Newfoundland um, and Labrador. Um, a really different place from a geographical point of view. Um, the geology in Newfoundland is really fascinating and really starting to get up now into an area of Canada that is a very obvious glaciated landscape. And um, you can see these, these rocks that have been ground down by the ice and they're not very far away from the surface of, the, of uh, what you see. So Memorial University in Newfoundland, Labrador um, is about 40 years old, so it's by quite a young university in many respects. Um, long before the Health Canada money came along, um, Memorial University was um, engaged in interprofessional education already. Um, they had things well established. Um, and, and a big part of the reason for this is because Newfoundland and Labrador are um, it's largely a rural community with only one relatively small urban area, one university, huge rural hinterland, uh, rural practice has really different models of care and it also significantly has different models of employment. Uh, so in the Faculty of Medicine at a memorial, um, there, are there are schools of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, social work and interestingly, kinesiology. Now at Memorial, they didn't have any PT or physiotherapy and OT training in Newfoundland. So if you want to be a PT or an OT, you've got to go to Nova Scotia as your next port of call. Um, but because these schools are co-located uh, within a small university, the opportunities for collaboration, of course, geographically and synergistically um, were, they were easy to, easy, easy to achieve um, because some of the um, pragmatic barriers were not in, in place in the way that they were at the University of Toronto. Um, but when the Health Canada money came along, um, Memorial was incredibly well placed to undertake a rapid enlargement of their um, IPE program. 
Um, Vernon Currens, the Professor of Medical Education there, um, and they were able to develop um, twin programs uh, to really uh, foster both interprofessional education between the undergraduate students, but also to have a parallel program of fostering interprofessional practice um, right across clinical disciplines, um, both in the hospital and in the community, um, and uh, reaching out into, not just at St John's, but reaching well out into the, into the rural areas as well. Um, so this interprofessional practice program um, is in part supported by the university, but it's in part supported by the local health authorities, um, and they've become known as a sort of almost a troubleshooting team, right? So you've got problems on your medical ward, you have got some dysfunctional relationships going on, call in the IPP team and they will, uh, they will come and assist you to, uh, try, to try and help. So as well as having, um, provide, trying to provide a scaffold for the interprofessional education students and fostering the IPP, in their own right, they've become uh, this, this teamwork help team, if you like. Um, that goes out and, and works. And they are inundated with, uh, with work. There's, there's too much work for them to cope with. Um, again, in spite of the busy service loads in those areas, um, there's a flourishing um, research program. Um, and Vernon Curran has spearheaded the development of a very impressive assessment rubric uh, that looks at how to assess interprofessional qualities um, in both students and at practices and um, that uh, that rubric uh, was also developed in association with people in Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, so it was quite exciting to go to Ottawa and then Toronto and then uh, go up to Newfoundland and they'd say, oh, so you've already seen, they knew I was coming. It was quite interesting to go around between um, between this, this very functional group of researchers. So the IPE is well embedded in the undergraduate components. It's, um, it, there are mandatory components um, at every university that I visited, some voluntary ones as well as at Queen's. Um, really important feature I think is the high level buy-in at universities um, and the research activity um, that's gone on to, um, to articulate the theoretical constructs for interprofessional practice and interprofessional education. And um, I think it's been those uh, theoretical constructs well articulated that have really helped to achieve that resource input from federal fu funds that Canada, um, Canada has, has used in a, a pretty exciting way. Um, so just then thinking about primary care practice, um, interesting to have a look at the family health teams that have been developed in Ontario. Um, and interesting to see how academic family practices might work in practice where um, the teaching is concentrated for medical education at undergraduate level but also importantly at the resident level. So um, seeing um, what residents or what we would call registrars um, and all levels of medical students all learning together in the same facility in significant numbers uh, was a scenario very different to the highly dispersed nature of um, teaching that we have in the community in New Zealand. Uh, the, um, nevertheless, having said that and being impressed by the educational programs, when it came down to looking at the interprofessional practice in, um, in family medicine in, in Canada, by and large, especially in the cities, it was still to me seen very physician centred. I think the role of the nurse is much better developed in New Zealand primary care than it is um, by and large um, in the urban areas in Canada. Um, there were nurse practitioners who I met and saw in many of the practices, but in nearly all the practices there was a lot of struggle to see how the nurse practitioner might fit into the team and how they might work. And at the moment it seemed as if the, uh, the nurse practitioners were working very much in parallel with the family physicians rather than working uh, together. So a lot of independent parallel practice. Family health teams are often um, based in hospitals or in the grounds of hospitals. This makes life easier for the medical students and for the residents to go between rotations and to track between places. Um, but it, was, um, it looked unusual to me, um, coming from New Zealand. Family medicine training, shorter time frame, more intensive program, much wider range of competencies um, than you'd see in New Zealand. Um, and I think very interestingly, the total number of years in tertiary education um, to train uh, family physicians is significantly shorter than it is, um, it is in New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, uh, it's 11 years minimum tertiary education to get to be a, um, a fellow of the College of GPs, which is our specialist qualification. Um, in Canada, uh, that's routinely possible in nine years. Um, and in Quebec, where there are some schools where um, they don't require a prerequisite undergraduate degree, um, seven years is, uh, is a possibility to train someone from, from school 
uh, to be a specialist GP. Incredibly short. And talking to the Canadians, this is, I mean, this is probably the shortest family medicine training program pathway in the world. Um, they did feel it was too short. And interestingly, for people going to remote rural practice, there's a third optional year in the residence program, which you have to apply for. That's very much oversubscribed, and the Canadian feeling was that, yeah, three years is probably a much better train length of training program than two years uh, post graduation. But nevertheless, that's still significantly shorter uh, than what we have in New Zealand. Uh, and I mean, the same, perhaps not to quite the same extent, um, but in, in nearly all the medical disciplines, the total number of years in training is shorter than it is in New Zealand. The years are academically longer, um, but the total number of years is, is much shorter. And I think that's something we really should think about in, uh, in New Zealand uh, when we're thinking about medical education, how long it takes, how expensive it is uh, to, train, to train doctors. Um, are there ways we could um, make, make the training shorter, um, more doable in terms of number of years of commitment that students have to have um, without compromising the quality of what, uh, what, our, what our graduate profile would be, would be at the end. Um, again, another family health team in a, next to a hospital, um, rather imposing buildings, but once you got inside, the, a lot of the uh, family medicine that was going on inside these buildings was just the same as it would be in a New Zealand uh, general practice setting. Um, the family health team practices in Ontario are supported by the Ontario government. Interestingly, all the staff are actually directly employed by, um, by the provincial government, um, so all the staff are salaried, uh, except for the physicians. Uh, and I think this difference in funding is one of the things uh, that, to some extent, I think, made me think, well, this looks still a pretty physician-centred way of delivering uh, fam family medicine. Um, the doctors still bill for services. They don't bill the patient because, of course, in Canada, um, no one pays at the point of consultation for care, in, whether it's primary or secondary care. So when you go to the family physician in Canada, you don't pay any money at the time. No money changes hands. Um, but the doctor is still generating their income by um, filling in a schedule and saying, uh, you know, I've seen you know patient one for contraception, I've seen patient two for obstetric care, I've seen patient three uh, for an ophthalmology consult, I've seen patient four, etc. Um, and that billing process is a fee-for-service system billing the government rather than the patient. Uh, so um, a significant difference to um, to how we how we work here. Um, the family health team concept is best developed in Ontario, not nearly as well developed in either Quebec and Newfoundland. Um, and so in urban areas in both of those areas, the family practices were generally, uh, generally not teams. There was still very much a predominant model of family physicians working in relative isolation, very few ancillary staff. And even in academic practices, uh, where the doctors were salaried to teach and practice, um, there was little evidence of collaborative practice. Um, and Fascinating, um, and I mean, I didn't know this before I went, but it was a real shock to go into a family physician office and see a pile of paper charts sitting on the counter, um, ready to be filled in. Uh, and it really did take me back to, you know, the mid 1990s in New Zealand when we first did the switch over to computerised clinical records in, in primary care here, uh, and made me realise that even for the people who were right at the forefront of this and who had got a had got clinical records um, on their computers, they were still very much working at the level of the individual patient record. They weren't accessing or utilising uh, the ability, once you have uh, clinical records computerised, to aggregate your data, to be able to run a clinical query or find out about the nature of your practice population, which is absolutely routine in New Zealand now, and which um, uh, not only um, GPs, but most of most nurses working in primary care are very au fait with being able to say at the click of a couple of you know couple of clicks on uh, the medtech query. Okay, so how many smokers have we got in the practice? How many of them are Maori? How many of them live in X Y Z streets, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, our ability to do those things in New Zealand. Um, it, it is really very good, and when you go to look at the Canadians still with their paper charts, you realise that uh, there are some things that we have done a great deal better um, than they're doing in Canada. There's been a lot of hold up in Canada while they've waited for federal money to fund systems which will cross the primary secondary care interface. That's a challenge which we haven't broken in New Zealand, but at least we've got on and done what we can do um, without waiting for um, someone to say this is the perfect system. Because there probably, there probably isn't one. 
Um, but if you go to the rural areas in Canada, it's a very different story. And um, if you fly far enough um, over the sea in the not very small aeroplane, uh, you get to the vast expanse that's Labrador, uh, way up in the northeast of Canada. Uh, very beautiful area and uh, very big and very isolated. However, in the middle of this wilderness is the Labrador Health Centre. Um, it's the only facility of its kind for thousands of kilometres around. Um, it's probably the smartest building in the little community of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, was an it was an impressive remote rural practice. Um, the population of this, all of this part of Labrador is about 10,000. Um, mostly concentrated in this little settlement of about seven or 8,000 people, with two or 3,000 people scattered over um, the rest of the coast of Labrador. Um, in mostly Inuit, Innu and Metis uh, and European people uh, are thinly scattered over this area of uh, Canada, um, with really huge and challenging health burdens, um, high maternal and infant mortality, um, alcohol, drug and tobacco addiction, very high youth suicide rate, um, and the diseases of um, Western diet and Western lifestyle with obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and high mortality uh, and premature death from cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, this facility in central Labrador is a 25 bed facility. About half of it um, is, um, is maternity workload. Um, and it's worth remembering that the age of first birth in this community, uh, the average age of first birth is 14 years old. So we're talking about a population of parents who are teenagers. Uh, and, the, um, and the elders in the communities are often in their 30s and 40s. When we, you know, you just don't see the equivalent of our kuria or kaumatua um, because they are dead, basically. Um, so 13 family physicians, one obstetrician, one surgeon, one anaesthetist um, run this facility entirely. Um, because there's only a single obstetrician, surgeon and anaesthetist, they're not always there. They sometimes do like to take holiday uh, and the, uh, the cover is, is not always there. Um, but a very, um, a very dedicated and committed team of nurses and nurse practitioners, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers, um, and as well as the 25 bed facility, about a dozen very small satellite clinics um, which are largely inaccessible, uh, were totally inaccessible before the advent of, um, of flying came to Labrador. Uh, most of these places still don't have road access and they're, and they're not likely ever to. The country is just too huge and vast and the population too small. Um, and the um, access by sea um, is um, not there in the winter because the pack ice um, is packs in all the top of Labrador, so you just don't uh, get there except by plane from about um, November through to about May. Uh, so very isolated communities. So to try and um, manage that remoteness of, um, of their remote clinics, um, the telemedicine facilities that uh, they have pioneered and set up in Labrador um, are very impressive um, and it was, uh, it was great to be able to see um, how they could have a robot in one of their remote clinics which is driven from, driven from a laptop based at the base uh, and they, could, uh, they, did, they did some amazing things there. Um, I mean this is uh, one of the days we were there, we were lucky enough to get offered a um, vacant spot on the hospital plane. They have a plane which goes around and collects all the patients who are going to be admitted for um, moderate, minor and moderate surgery for the next day or the next couple of days. So we went off as passengers on this hospital plane and we collected people who were due to have a um, wound debridement of a uh, injury, um, a carpal tunnel syndrome done, uh, that kind of level of surgery. So those, this plane would go out and collect all these people and then fly them back to base to have their surgery. Um, depending on whether they were Inuit or Innu people, uh, depended on which hostel they were put up at when they arrived back at Happy Valley Goose Bay. There was someone detailed to look after them. Um, for some of these people, um, this trip to this tiny settlement of Goose Bay of about 6,000 people was the biggest place they'd ever been to. Um, so it's very easy uh, to forget that while Canada is a modern multicultural country with big cities, there are also people who have never been to a place that's bigger than six or 7,000 people. So it's a, it's a vast thing. And I think, I mean, just to give you an idea there, Labrador mostly is um, rock, small tree, a few more small trees, bog, swamp, lake, rock, 
small trees, bog, swamp, lake. I mean, that's mostly what it is. Uh, and in the summer, um, this has got a lot of insects. It has an intense black fly season, uh, which makes life very unpleasant um, during the summer months. Uh, and then it, free it all starts to freeze up in October, November. Um, and this was the one place in Canada where people said, we just love the winter. We wouldn't live here if it wasn't for the winter because everything freezes up and you actually can get places that you, on your snowmobile and on your, I mean in days gone by of course on your, in your snowshoes and your, with, your, uh, with, your, with your dogs, but nowadays there are skidoos and there are uh, all sorts of things designed for going over the ice and the snow at, at fast and exciting rates. Uh, so the winter is a look forward to season. But the Labrador Health Centre, I think, was a real, it was an academic practice par excellence, and it was a real model in um, both the teaching and learning side of an academic practice, and that there were, when we were there, there were um, medical students, uh, there were family medicine residents, there was a paediatric resident who was doing a stint in this clinic, um, and there were also nursing students, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, etc. Um, there were joint clinical appointments for staff, and the academic staff were all members of Memorial University, which is about four days' drive away and a, with a ferry ride thrown in the middle, and that's in good weather. Uh, so distance, no object. Beautiful area of the country. This is the Churchill River. Um, and the research that was going on at that academic practice was also very impressive. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the most senior um, person at the clinic um, was very interesting... Um, very um, humble, I think, uh, self-effacing um, family physician who'd lived in this community for nearly 30 years and spent hours, weeks and, and years working with local communities. The, the, the groups of First Nations people are known as bands uh, and they vary in size quite a lot. So um, developing a very what's been a very successful um, research program to reduce maternal and infant mortality, um, they were able to set up a um, an intervention uh, with some communities um, to get women to come in at 37 weeks to the base facility before they had their babies um, and uh, then go home um, again afterwards. Some of the communities didn't want to participate in this scheme so they had a nice control arm to their trial um, and very impressive results at reducing maternal and infant mortality in that program. But interestingly one of the most positive spin-offs in that kind of program uh, was the fact that they all these young women, and remember they're only 14 and 15 year olds, they bring them to base um, to wait for their babies to be born, rather than have them get bored and spend all their time smoking outside the uh, facility, uh, they put in place a very intensive health education parenting program for those women, um, talking about smoking cessation, dealing with some of the huge alcohol issues, um, looking at parenting techniques, etc. And they're now starting to see, six, seven years after this program was implemented, um, that those women are coming back in much better shape for their second pregnancies than they were in their first pregnancies. And I think that's a, you know, that was very impressive um, results from, uh, from action, action research right um, in, in the community. They're working on mental health interventions, um, the youth suicide rate being so high amongst the Inuit people. Um, when people first said to me, it's 26 times the average Canadian youth suicide rate, I said, you mean 2.6? No, 26 times. So there has to be something seriously wrong um, with uh, communities which have such a high youth suicide rate, fueled undoubtedly by alcohol um, and other drug addiction problems, um, but there must be much deeper causes for those kind of figures um, than uh, you know, what you and I might class as health-related health challenges. Uh, they have um, now interactive intervention programs um, looking at uh, lifestyle interventions, hugely challenging, trying to deal with nutrition, uh, trying to deal with um, cooking. A lot of these people have lost their traditional ability to hunt for caribou, which is a main staple of their diet, uh, and don't know how to do it anymore. Um, the way they know how to get food is to uh, spend their money on going to the fast food outlets to, uh, to get food. So, interesting. And I think the other thing that was very impressive um, at the Labrador Health Centre was that they're just now about to embark on a program, of a, on a PhD program of having non-clinical PhD students actively researching in these communities um, and argued very successfully that there's no way you should have people doing research on these communities from outside. But if you want to do research in a, in a First Nations setting, then 
the first thing you have to do is come and live and be part of and earn your, earn your way into that community before you will do research that's actually going to make a difference and is actually going to engage with the people you really need to research with. So some very impressive things going on um, in, in this area. The collaborative practice was really impressive up here. Daily team meetings, um, because it's a tiny facility with 25 beds, all the staff get together for half an hour every morning. They run through the list of who's admitted in the last 24 hours, who's been discharged. Um, it just was completely routine to go from a complex maternity case mm -hmm. to a surgical one, to a trauma, um, to a mental health issue. Everyone knew about it, and then away they went. It was so, so simple. <laughs> um, the, the supervision of the staff at remote clinics was done through, um, this, is, this is Michael Jean, who was the senior physician here. Um, on that laptop he has got there in front of him, he is driving his robot uh, in a clinic about 500 kilometres away. And he drives it round and this machine will just come through the door and around the corner and it'll say, oh hello Peter, how are you today? And it'll carry on. You can conduct emergency resuscitation through this facility, um, you can conduct teaching sessions, you can conduct mental health consultations, all sorts of things which um, they, are, they are doing here. Uh, and the interprofessional learning uh, was there all the time. So that's it about Canada. Um, welcome some questions if there are any, um, but it was a fascinating trip and I guess I should say thanks to the University of Otago for funding me <laughs> partly and putting me on study leave to guide. So thank you. <laughs>
the Canadians have a misplaced focus on privacy and um, they're, they're very nervous about what they see as some aspects of collectivised socialism. Mm. So that the notion about a, a single health card, you know, in Ontario we have the Ontario um, Health Insurance Plan um, card but all the regulations around not letting that be used for anything other than health. And it seemed to me often there'd be simpler ways of doing it, but they keep on getting caught up by their need for privacy, much mm. more than mm. here. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's not all golden, yeah. but um, it was fascinating for you, yeah. Yeah. for me to hear your take on the yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's such a contrast to New Zealand where I think they're better at articulating the problems, at doing the research, but when you get down to the pra everyday routine practice, I think, the, I think there are things we do better. Yes. So, um, I'm from, as you, I think you know, looking for dinners in London, and um, they're having difficulty finding common ground with the nursing school. Was there any sign of that, particularly in the more urban aspects of, of the Canadian system that you saw? Um, well, remember, I was looking particularly at undergraduate programs mm. here. Um, and no, I don't think there was too much trouble finding common ground on a case-based arrangement. Um, but it's a long way, I mean, it's not like, the components that are shared are relatively small. Mm. It's not like you've got one year out of four that's all done together. That doesn't happen. There are specific components, and they are very much based around individual patient cases and care. So, looking at the roles and responsibilities of each of the people in the team. Um, but the the nursing buy-in was very impressive, actually. Well, I, I'm just thinking about the, you know, the university training in the United States. Where in 1970, I went out with a nurse, mm -hmm. my first Saturday as a medical student, mm -hmm. to look at kids and, mm -hmm. and um, various uh, worms mm -hmm. in their um, water systems and so forth, and and I was working with a, a third year nursing student, and she mm. taught me a great deal about mm. you know how you mm. did that. And those are programs that we were doing you know, mm. forty years ago. Now. Yeah, and I mean I think some of those have disappeared actually. Mm. You know we the, the kind of experiences you and I got, uh, some of those have disappeared. Mm. Uh, but it seems to me that given that our interprofessional practice is in many ways I think equal or better than um, the Canadians. To me, that's the place where we should be starting thinking about interprofessional education. It's right in our clinical placements. That's where that's the place where I think would be the easiest um, and make the most sense for us to um, have a look at models of models of care. Okay, um, so <coughs> time is up. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Sue once again and invite you all to. <laughs>